Right, so I am Professor Leukocyte and Stem Cell Biology and Head of Agenda Pharmacology. Not something I'm going to talk to you tonight. So, I'm also dyslexic and dyspraxic. So, double trouble. And I can sum up my experience of school in two words. Humiliation and frustration. Humiliation of being told I was slow, of being taken out of class for remedial spelling lessons, and the frustration of not being able to get all my ideas onto paper. So dyslexia is the most common specific learning disability, with at least 10% of the population being dyslexic. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus this talk on dyslexia. So you probably know about the challenges of dyslexia, and I've mentioned a few. Having poor literacy skills is the main one, being a slow reader, poor speller. However, sadly, it doesn't stop there. So um, being, um, so it doesn't, literacy is just one of the problems, but these are considered the tip of the iceberg. Dyslexia is commonly associated with people having a slow processing speed, being disorganized, having <coughs> poor time management skills, which will obviously negatively impact them both in their education, but also their working life. So my experience is that this very negative deficit picture of dyslexia is what we as parents are presented with by educational psychologists and teachers <coughs> in schools. This is why I was told that my son was not capable of doing triple science in GCSE. So if this, if this is the case, why is it that there are some amazingly successful dyslexic scientists? And interesting that two of these are also very successful entrepreneurs. And in one study it was found that 35% of entrepreneurs in the US were indeed dyslexic. And in the UK we have no shortage of successful dyslexic entrepreneurs. And it's important to note that as scientists in the UK, today we are actively being encouraged to be entrepreneurs. Now, someone asked me the other day, um, why aren't there more successful female dyslexic scientists? I reflected on this and I think my personal answer to that question is quite simple. I could hide my dyslexia, but I couldn't hide the fact that I was a woman. And I think that's another story. But it's interesting to note that Carol Grider, shown here, didn't reveal her dyslexia until she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. So that's not going to happen to me, so I've decided to reveal it now. <laughs> so why are these people such successful scientists, given that they have a learning disability? Well, people with dyslexia process information in a fundamentally different way. Someone once said to me that the world is full of PCs, but you're a Mac. And I think that's a great analogy for being dyslexic. So the problem comes when, as a Mac, you're asked to function like a PC. If I'm asked to function like a PC, I can do it, but you're not going to see my full potential. So why do people with dyslexia make successful scientists? This is where we need to consider the strengths that are associated with being dyslexic. Creativity <coughs> is the biggest one. This is why many dyslexics become artists or go into creative <coughs> professions. But we must remember that being innovative and creative is also key to being a great scientist. Dyslexics are known to have great oral communication skills, with a specific ability to find simple ways of explaining complex ideas. They also have good collaborative skills. In addition, they are known to be visionary and good at big picture thinking. They have the ability to see links between disparate ideas and concepts and have an ability to think outside the box. All these strengths are the attributes that I look for in my students. And I think they're the reason why people with dyslexia can be successful scientists. Indeed, I think my own success is down to my dyslexic strengths as I apply these skills to my research, my teaching, my public engagement activities. 
it's also interesting to reflect that the World Economic Forum have highlighted what are the key 21st century career skills. And it's important to note that a lot of these are similar to those dyslexic strengths. And also that knowledge acquisition and recall is not on the list. So it's distressing, therefore, for me to see that in the UK today, pupils with specific learning disabilities are underperforming in STEM subjects. So that's where we're at. What are we going to do about it here in the UK? Well, for my part, I've started by setting up the Two Empower project. This is the aims are to celebrate neurodiversity in STEM, to make STEM accessible for neurodiverse students throughout their education, and to enable neurodiverse students to fulfill their potential in STEM. <coughs> so as part of this project within Imperial, what we have been doing is to start to make our teaching and learning inclusive for students with specific learning difficulties. So we're doing this um, in a number of ways, primarily by raising awareness of neurodiversity and the challenges and strengths of neurodiverse students, providing free assistive technologies to all staff and students, making teaching materials accessible and available in different formats, and where possible, taking exams and extended essays away and replacing them with multiple authentic assessments, such as grant writing, data analysis, public engagement activities. So this project, I'm working collaboratively with David Mooney in the Disability Advisory Service and um, Katie Paluto in the Education Development Unit. Oops, that wasn't what I was supposed to do. <laughs> Let's see. <coughs> Mm. Right, great. <coughs> <laughs> okay. So. Okay, the Two Empower project also provides training workshops for STEM PGCE students with respect to how to identify students with learning disabilities in the classroom and how to teach STEM subjects to students with learning disabilities. So this is obviously in the context of school. Um, and then we have um, bespoke, we have developed, sorry, spoke um, STEM workshops for high ability students with specific learning difficulties and their parents. So we've developed and delivered these both for students with dyslexia and also for students that have autistic spectrum disorder. So when I say we, this is a team of people that I have been working with. Um, particularly with Dr. Susan Smith, who's an expert in twice exceptional education, and also fantastic STEM teachers, SENCOs, and other um, neurodiverse academics. So I have to say this has been the most fun and rewarding outreach project that I've ever worked on. I've been blown away by how far the students have traveled um, to attend these workshops and, in particular, the response of, of parents to these workshops. I'll just let you digest a few of those comments. I, one more slide. So I'd just like to leave you with this quote from Steve Jobs and acknowledge funding to establish the Two Empower project from the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial and also the Wellcome Trust. Thank you. <laughs>